have to. Definitely. Definitely. Good evening, everybody. I'm Dr. Swati Chakraborty, your platform moderator for Web Platform for Dialogue. Web Platform for Dialogue has been created in the month of May 2020, when actually we are uh, not in a mood that what should we do in this pandemic, how we can actually utilize in a proper, fruitful way of our journey of our academic life. So I thought that let's have a round of webinar with from wonderful person from all over the world, from India and abroad, to know about their work and how we can actually collaborate as a researcher, as a guide, so we can have appropriate guidance from the experts. So today is in the session of August webinar series. We are very, very lucky to have Dr. Sonali Gupta. And our today's moderator is wonderful person from New Delhi from National Museum. She is Dr. Uh, upcoming Dr. Abira Bhattacharya. Uh, she is assistant curator for National Museum New Delhi. She is doing a PhD in the Department of History. So I hand over the session, particularly for today's session, to Abira to introduce Dr. Sonali and her work for our uh, today's participants in the webinar series in August. So I request all of you to please mute yourself. And if you have any question, uh, just write in the chat box. So after uh, Dr. Gupta's presentation, Abira will definitely guide you how to interact with Dr. Sonali, maybe in person, maybe only in the chat support. So uh, please raise your question, but only in the chat box. And I request all of you that please bear with us, as we all know that we can't uh, depend on our internet connectivity on our power cutting. So I really, really request all of you, if there is any kind of technical issues, please bear with us. Thank you so much. Abira, it's your session now. Uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Swati, for introducing me and giving me this opportunity to moderate this session of my uh, of my teacher, actually. Like she taught me when I was doing my master's. And uh, just to briefly tell about Dr. Sonali, uh, she received her PhD in Egyptian archaeology from the Kotsen Institute of Archaeology, UCLA. She taught as a dean's lecturer at UCL was appointed as director of public programs at Kotsen Institute of Archaeology. She was also a postdoctoral fellow at UCLA and where she worked on the textiles of the Iwan people, people of Borneo. She has conducted two field schools with IFR on myth and reality and is the founding director of Himalayan Institute of Cultural and Heritage Studies based in Kullu Valley, Himachal Pradesh, India. She has taught various subjects such as African archaeology, principles of archaeology, historical archaeology, anthropological, and archaeology as tools for studying contemporary social issues, amongst other. She, is al she also holds a law degree. So today, uh, Dr. Sonali will be talking about her contribution and about her academic uh, journey in the field of Himalayan archaeology and ethnographic studies. So I would request to Dr. Sonali to kindly deliver her talk. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much, Abira. And uh, it gives me so much of happiness that through you, I've been able to uh, meet uh, Dr. Swati virtually and all of you are, who are in attendance here. And uh, Abira especially, it uh, really gives me a lot of happiness that you're the uh, moderator because having known you for so many years, uh, I, I take immense pride in having you, you know, as a moderator. You're such a wonderful person um, um, to be juxtaposed with, <laughs> right? <laughs> uh, and and for those of you who've just joined, um, uh, please uh, forgive the darkness uh, around me that surrounds me. Kulu Valley is not always like this. It's just that there's been a power cut. And uh, uh, just when I was, I logged on and I was all ready and suddenly the power goes off and I was like, yeah, that's Murphy's Law. And I'm sure it will come back. So um, you will have a better view of the space that I'm in. Uh, well, um, welcome all of you uh, to be uh, spending this evening uh, listening to me. So it gives me um, 
um, immense happiness that uh, you can dedicate a little bit of your time uh, for this. Uh, so, Abira, where should I start? Tell me. Yes, ma'am. <laughs> Please tell us about your work. Like, we are very curious to know about that. Like, we have okay. been seeing your works, like your Instagram page, your talks, but then we want to listen more about it. Okay. So, I'll start off uh, with uh, a little bit of my journey. And, uh, Abira, I tend to kind of engro get engrossed when I'm talking about. Uh, uh, the journey, so stop me if I'm going too much into detail, okay? Because you're the moderator, so you have the right to stop me. Now, um, it all started uh, when I was um, uh, a lawyer, uh, much before that. When I was very young, I used to go to, uh, you know, the Roman Forum with my father and all these different archaeological spaces, and I always yearned to be a part of history a part of archaeology and that prompted me to do my master's in history um, from Delhi University and uh, I did my bachelor's my master's in history uh, but after that um, I took a detour and it was because you know my father would my father was in the foreign services and he said uh, you know Sonali whatever you want to do uh, make sure that uh, you have a professional degree with you and of course uh, doing archaeology was a uh, not um, the easy way out. My father wanted to wanted to sit for the civil services or uh, get a professional degree, and I thought of getting into law. And um, I uh, enrolled in uh, law college in Delhi University. I became a lawyer, and uh, I practiced criminal law for about uh, four years in Delhi and two years in the U.S. And uh, during that thing, I was. Um, um, I kind of always yearned to be in the schools, to be a part of, you know, all that I had read, Mohenjo-Daro, Harappa, the Circle of Indus Valley, and all those things used to come back to me. And I decided, I said, now I have a professional degree, I'm going to get back to archaeology. So, in between, I was associated with the Indian Archaeological Society, and uh, during the summers or um, whenever I had time, I would go for and how I kept in touch with that day. And then um, I went to the US. I practiced law there for two years, but the school of archaeology was just too strong to resist. And I got into education archaeology. I uh, studied and I um, got into a um, um, school of archaeology, hostel, my JRE, all of that. And uh, Egyptian archaeology was for almost a decade. So that's been my journey of uh, law and archaeology. And I always, uh, when people ask me, why, you know, law and archaeology, they're so separate. They're so separate. But I will always tell them, you, I will always tell them that, you know what, archaeology and law are like um, the yin and the yang. Uh, it's like uh, archaeologists put all the evidence together. They are trying to work for the plaintiff or the defendant, like the lawyer. They're trying to solve a case. And uh, even archaeologists do the same. It's just that um, they separated uh, and uh, the um, uh, characters uh, uh, are not uh, standing there alive. They're muted by you know the period of history that they've left behind. So that's the commonality, you know. And I always feel, I always think like I'm a lawyer trying to prove something and um, uh, and that makes it even more interesting. And um, uh, so the best part of it was that when I first gave my first lecture in uh, Dr. Sonali. Uh, I think there is some network issue. Yeah, there is some network issue. Uh, like yeah. her video has got frozen and yes. her voice is cracking. Yes, yes. Let's wait for some time. I think she will be back. I and think like she, her electricity is back and she is going to shift I to Wi-Fi. Like she said yes. that at the beginning. Yes, yes, that's right.
uh, i request all of you to please uh, bear with us and have some patience she will be joining very soon i feel going to change her network so i think there is the shifting things going on so that's why hi dr sonali yes you are back but yes so forgive me uh, audience okay <laughs> So Abira, where was I? You were discussing about uh, your your beginning in archaeology, like how it piqued your interest and your shift of like you took a detour from your as a career from a lawyer, and then you started your journey. And then after that, it, your voice was little bit uh, shaky. We couldn't hear you clearly. Okay. Okay. so i was talking about the commonality between uh, law and archaeology is how you know you prove your case point and your either for the plaintiff or the defendant and um, so finally you know when i gave my first lecture as a grad student in oakland for uh, our egyptology uh, talks you know uh, uh, somebody in the audience said oh um, so now you talk like a lawyer and i just smirked because i i knew i was a lawyer i didn't reveal it so i said okay so somewhere my experience as a lawyer or my education as a lawyer has helped me to prove my point right so why i'm telling you all of this is that whatever one may do in life okay it is always an addition for what you're going to do in the future so one should never uh, uh negate the um importance of education right even if it is totally different it does help you in some way or the other with what you really are passionate for for what you really want to do so that's been a, a you know a little bit of my journey where you know i went from law to archaeology and um, yeah so abira you keep the questions going so that you know i can kind of otherwise i'll uh, kind of get scattered yeah sure like i'm also keep check, like i will keep checking uh, whatever questions we are receiving so then i will put those questions uh, for you so that mm -hmm. we can have a more interactive session uh, you can proceed your talk ma'am okay so yeah. i joined the kochan institute of archaeology at ucla so um you know we have about uh, every year only five or six students are chosen and uh, i was very happy to be included in that cohort uh, where five or six of us we were really very um uh, we worked very hard very very hard and when i said very very hard it was really very very hard uh, i remember i used to come back from uh, university i would not even keep my backpack down and i would be like working in the kitchen trying to make my meal and then i had to do my assignments and you know burn the midnight oil and uh, it, it it was just a roller coaster ride and um, it was a very very um, wonderful journey you know going to egypt uh, for 4 uh, to 5 months of the year uh, staying in tents uh, learning about archaeology hands on uh, my uh, professor and chair Uh, Dr. Vilika Vendrick, who is now the director of the Kochan Institute, um, she was an inspiration, of course. She would always uh, just um, have us in the field and just throw us there and be there if we had questions. So we really learned it uh, the hard way. And uh, being in Egypt was like uh, being home, learning the language, living in the village, just picking up the language from the locals, starting to learn Arabic, which is so different from what I had ever known. and just uh, spending our time and immersing ourselves in uh, hard work and culture and um, uh, the field of archaeology uh, was uh, a memory that can never be uh, erased from our mind and then uh, after all of this my dissertation session was um, on a topic that was very close to my heart and i want to talk about my dissertation because i feel that uh, that was so instrumental in how i have lived my life so being from india and because my father was in the foreign services i changed a lot of schools and i i i was in a in very different cultural context all of my life i've lived in indonesia in italy in sweden uh, in trinidad and tobago and some of those places so every uh, uh, transfer for my father uh, was a, a change of place for me where whenever i used to find my bearings in a place it was time to move on again to learn a different language 
and that has always been the case so uh, i feel that that experience uh, growing up has left me being a nomad so if i am in a place for too long i feel it's time to move so my husband kind of gets uh, a little upset when i say i'm going i'm going to work so he says oh my god sonali this is uh, is this what archaeology is all about i said yes it is like that you have to be a nomad but you have to keep the balance so um what happened is i was telling you about how growing up uh, um, uh, affected my topic for my dissertation my dissertation was on cultural transmission in the greco roman period in egypt i was looking at potters how they transferred their skill from generation to generation and what i did was i annotated their gestures their postures so i used a very anthropological approach in addressing an archaeological question of whether you can find schools of learning and teaching in the archaeological record whether people the potters leave markers in artifacts like pottery where you can ascertain what are the movers and shakers of learning and teaching because these very things tell us about tradition about continuity and about change and uh, i was able to reflect on that and i was able to write my dissertation because having been a person who grew up in different places i had to rewire my brain all the time so it was all about learning and being taught when i went to the states and i enrolled in the grad program the methodology of teaching was very different and of learning was very different so i had to rewire my brain again to understand how to grasp these things that are taught in a very different fashion from what i was used to so that was what prompted me to choose my dissertation topic that is the main stay of my work so even though i've done egyptian archaeology i am still doing cultural transmission in the himalayas now so uh, that in short is uh, about my dissertation so abira you can so, i think it will really help yeah. you guys so we have and- got some few questions yeah. like uh, the first question uh, is like uh, like how anthropology and archaeology is creating an impact on the youth and is that only a subject or more than that then uh, people mm-hmm. like um, those who are listening like they would like to uh learn something like how uh the concept of anthropology is changing in himalayas and how uh, it is perceived nowadays so how it has changed the anthropological survey especially in himalayan region so these are the two questions so first of all i'll begin with you know when i was in school um in in college in delhi university uh, archaeology came under history right uh, anthropology was a different department so we were not even involved that much my uh, interface with uh, anthropology began in um in, in the us their anthropological theory was very important with along with archaeological theory and i feel like uh, i i call myself an anthropological archaeologist because i feel that understanding the past is not possible unless you understand the present and for me uh, for any excavations even before we begin excavations i feel ethnography uh, et- the ethnographic experience is very very important for an archaeologist because unless you know the cultural context unless you know the people unless you know the stories the folklore you cannot you cannot understand the past and even though you are far separated by time you know the present and the past is you know um um separated by a uh, by different periods it depends on what period you are uh, working on but uh, the knowledge of the present becomes very important and uh, i feel that it has helped me immensely in my work in understanding the point of view of people understanding the etic and the emic perspectives the outsider and the insider perspective and it has it has helped me to um keep myself in check that i'm neutral you know i'm not carrying my cultural baggage with me even if i am it helps me to take a step back and and see and understand and view the past with that kind of uh, a mindset so uh, i guess that answers the question about the importance of anthropology at least in in my work abira 
is abira there okay uh yes i think what is right yes yes abira also facing some internet issues yes that that was my question so thank you so much you have pointed out very rightly and we have another uh, question from yeah. kamal uh, she is from iraq yeah. she is a wonderful person uh, uh, practicing bahai and uh, wonderful person i personally know karbal so that's why her question is i was part of unesco one but i noticed the weakness in the department of heritage to department uh, in a department because of limited access of unesco to access in need of preservation limited authority oh, okay preservation limited preservation authority over nations or no power in addition to a big problem of funding that's the issue i'm sorry abida i have taken your responsibility <laughs> please excuse me <laughs> yeah uh, dr sanali your um, and my power has come back so yeah maybe i can change the network so that it's smoother so just give me a second wonderful. it is yeah wonderful dr finali yes yes perfect meanwhile i am welcoming all of your uh, presence here i can see uh, anjali ma'am and other uh, visual lakshmi ma'am also so a wonderful uh, reunion kind of thing i only once met anjali ma'am for a while uh, i'm really sorry i think you never remember me <laughs> a very small person from madhvi gulaki we have another question that uh, could you please uh, shed some light on uh, phenomenological anthropology phenomenological anthropology okay so what what's the question again because i think i i kind of lost you it was okay. uh, the okay. the voice fine, was fine. shaky fine fine the question from kamal is uh, that uh, she was part of unesco one and notice the weakness in the department of heritage due to the limited access of uh, the unesco preservation because of authority over nation or no power and in addition the big problem regarding funding so it's just i think mm -hmm. observation from kamal so would you like to comment on that any kind of comment <laughs> i think it is very important for unesco to uh, have the uh, people who are totally involved you know in the, in the nation state that they really uh, want to work with that the locals and the people who really are aware of the uh, specific heritage problems are taken in uh, um, in a lot of cases i feel that um, uh, you know the big wigs take uh, uh, decisions on policy but i feel it has it has to go to the people who actually work in those places and involve them uh, that's very important so um, i guess and also uh, with the um, countries like ours you know developing nations uh, in the mindset you know uh, heritage is there but there are more pressing problems like uh, uh, poverty and uh, education and things like that so heritage takes a back seat right so it's very important for all of us to come together and especially give a lot of importance in schools for subjects uh, like history and um, uh, uh, heritage and things like that it start at the school level sometimes i feel even in the kullu valley the local students have no idea about the beautiful heritage that they have because the impetus is always on sciences and becoming something you know becoming a professional becoming this becoming that and uh, in the in the process they lose out on what is around them their identity and it's very important to start young so i feel that um, each one of us in our own spaces we need to do that with our own families with our own children so that is my take on it yeah so oh, abira you want to take the next question Abira, I can't uh, hear you. Abira, unmute I... yourself. Yeah. yeah. You're not able to mute. Okay. But uh, you have to do from your end because I can't do. Could you please rejoin, Abira? if that solves the issue i'll wait for abira yeah. to join yeah but i'm so happy that the power yes. has come she will join soon
It's nice to see Anjali, ma'am. So happy you're here. <laughs> And there are a few questions here. Yeah, there's some questions by Medhavi and Firdos. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Uh, yeah. So now I'm audible. I think like I have unmuted myself. So, uh, so ma'am, I wanted to ask you like what are what are the kind of challenges uh, you are facing while conducting your anthropological uh, studies in the Himalayan region because the weather and the climatic conditions are a bit harsh. And also, there are problems with accessibility. So, oh, uh, weather-wise, it's totally fine. I'm like in the middle Himalaya, so uh, the weather is not really a challenge. Uh, just a few floods in the monsoons, where bridges get swept away, is the worst that I've seen. Or uh, you know, the trout fish jumping over the road into somebody else's uh, property is uh, something really interesting that I've seen. Uh, but nothing uh, so serious that uh, makes me uh, feel that working in the Himalayas is a challenge. But as far as uh, um, the people acceptability goes, I think uh, over a period of time, and I've been working here for two and a half years, uh, acceptability takes time. Even if you become a part of this uh, landscape and you you start living here, you don't uh, belong. And this is and this is my recent experience that. Even if you are an Indian, you've been living here for 20, 30 years, you're still not, you, you do not belong. And when I say belong, it's being from here, from the valley. And that makes me um, a little sad, okay? Uh, but it is what it is. Uh, I try to be a part of this. Um, uh, uh, you know, being an outsider insider because I consider myself an insider because I'm Indian, I'm involved in all of this and this is so close to my heart. Uh, but I also understand there's some some things that I really uh, I, I, I really can't do anything about it. So acceptability is a little challenging. But having said that, uh, when it comes to asking them questions, or uh, uh, probing or uh, learning about their culture, they're very open about it. But belonging is something that will um, perhaps never happen. Um, yeah, I have seen your videos in which like, uh, like there is a lot of focus on community engagement, like how like you are involved getting involved in their dance forms and their performances. And I have seen like the kind of acceptability, acceptability they have also shown towards you and your work. Uh, do you think like uh, creating a museum in the future would be a good idea? Like a living museum? I have thought of creating a museum and uh, my idea for museum is uh, collecting um, uh, objects uh, that are close to the not not valued by what we think is value because you know value is also something uh, uh, which is qualified in very different terms. What is valuable for me? Something maybe um, this would be valuable. Why? Because it's been given to my grandmother. You know, maybe it's not uh, very very expensive and uh, you could find it cheap. But value is something how you relate to an object and what uh, memories are embedded in it to make it valuable in a very different sense. So I feel, I feel, and it's on my mind that I want to create a museum that revolves around embedded memories that make the object. You know, you have uh, museums like the 1947 Partition Museum in Amritsar and all of that. So I want to create a revolving museum where every village gives one object from each family, and I have like, a, you know, I curate that and I have a note about it, and people from that village come and see what that object, you know, why is it important? And they try to understand why a particular object has been um, displayed by some other family. They get to know each other. Their ties also get stronger in the process. And they understand uh, uh, why something is so uh, dear to somebody. You know, it's, uh, I, think, I think it will um, reflect on their own ties, on their heritage, and a chance for others who want to visit to see uh, um, uh, this um, a story, a narrative that is woven through objects. So I uh, think that kind of museum is so, in my mind. Uh, like, uh, like, do you think like the people when you interact with the people, uh, the inhabitants of the region, they are uh, like 
I don't think they will be well acquainted with the idea of the museum. But uh, are they willing to engage themselves in kind of some kind of museum activity and create a memory house of their own? Uh, yeah, of course they are. I've spoken to a few, and I've said, you know, if you have a, a utensil or something that is uh, dear to you, uh, they'll be ready to give it. And I want to um, share this example. You know, I've worked with the Ababda community in Egypt. So uh, Egypt has two deserts: the Western Desert and the Eastern Desert. So in the Eastern Desert, I've worked in a place called Berenike, which had trade ties with India in uh, the early historic period. Uh, it was a port. Berenike was a port, and uh, I excavated there in the year 20. Uh, uh, I think it was 2011 when the Arab uh, Revolution took place. I was stuck there for three months. So uh, it was a beautiful place to get stuck, right? Like how we are stuck in the pandemic in the Kulu Valley. That was another place which was very beautiful. It was right next to the Red Sea and uh, really nice with the Ababdas and the Bashari people, who are the original inhabitants of these deserts. Now, uh, my uh, my professor, um, uh, Dr. Velika Vendrick, she made a museum, uh, a, a museum for the Ababdas. Uh, it got constructed with local material, and they put glass and everything. And the uh, Ababdas uh, were asked to showcase what they loved, what they thought was important, and uh, they showcased that. So, if anybody goes to Egypt to that region, it's in the middle of the desert. You can uh, see that museum, and the Ababdas feel so much of pride showing that. So, I think uh, right now, uh, Himachal has uh, you know a lot of museums. There is a local museum here for the people of Kulu in Manali, but I feel it's very uh, people are very engaged with the museum kind of setup because it doesn't really engage the look. You know, it doesn't it doesn't have a dialogue. Uh, mm -hmm. And I think for museums, it's very important to have an active, interactive kind of commitment. You know, because it's their heritage, and you cannot just put a bin a, a pane, a glass pane, and separate them. Uh, it's more than that. It needs to speak. It needs to be something more than that, you know, which can speak of their culture and their heritage and something that they feel attracted to. There's so many people around here who haven't even visited that place. So uh, I think uh, for you as a curator, uh, I'm sure uh, you must have so many ideas up your sleeve on uh, you know, how to make that happen. I have. Few ideas, but uh, yeah, I feel that there's a lot of engagement in uh, the museum setup um, in these places. Yeah, I agree with you. Like while we are working in the anthropology uh, section, like we need to. Uh, like bring the community engagement aspect as one of the important aspect because much knowledge which is shared by the elders of the community it's not codified in any of the texts or in the books so that's like a precious prized possessions which is only with the community people and uh, like i have seen your videos like how you are also focusing on the intangible cultural heritage of the region and uh, like uh, like do you want to like What's your idea of like preserving that intangible cultural heritage? Like, you want to create some documentaries, you want to create some kind of uh, like like a you want to bring it on a digital platform so that people can have an easy access to that. So, what are the ideas for bringing intangible cultural heritage to the commoners who are not residing within Kullu Valley, but they can have an easy easy access to the to the culture of that region? Okay. So, uh, so first of all, I do want to say, you know, Dr. Anjali is here, and she's done so much of work on intangible cultural heritage with her songs of uh, the Ganga, and uh, I, she's so, ma'am, you're so inspiring to me. So, so many have been working on intangible cultural heritage, like uh, Dr. Anjali has recorded these songs, and now they're a part of the book that all of you should uh, definitely uh, purchase on uh, on the Ganga, which is so important. The river is so important to us Indians as a whole. Now, when I talk about intangible cultural heritage here, what I am doing. So every year when my students come, I ask them to make short films, ten-minute short films, plus they write a paper. So that's the academic part of it. But I do tell them that you know you do not want to subject your students to academic jargon. Uh, you don't want your friends and family to sit down and read a piece of paper that you've written ten page long with all that of those academic words and theories. They will just be so tortured if they have to do that. So, what do you do to tell them about your experience, about what you've learned? Because you need to share 
Because if you don't share, what does it mean to work? To work on heritage, it doesn't mean anything if you can't share it with people, right? Uh, it should not be confined to academia, and that is one of the main things that um, I, I, I kind of uh, uh, propound. That uh, uh, being an academic, my work should not just be focusing on academia. It has to go elsewhere as well, right? Not just um, 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 confined to talk. in history uh, in, in in newspapers about some excavation about some work going on but where people can be a part of it where they involved in it. so yeah yeah so uh, talking about uh, so when my students come i ask them to make short 10 minutes uh, their research project huh so all the community together and okay there there's some disturbance coming yeah there's uh, some disturbance coming like your voice is missing for like few seconds then it's coming back i think maybe maybe can we check if somebody has their um, mic unmuted because it's a static uh, no no everybody have okay now it's no better. everybody have muted yeah I think there is some uh, coming from. Yeah, I think there is some network issue. Yeah, yeah. Here, okay. The network is fine. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. So uh, the villagers, the town people, they come and they watch, and they are amazed at the things that the students have researched and they found, and that helps them reconnect with their heritage at a deeper level. Okay. So that's one thing which is very important. That wherever you work, you need to involve the community, and I think most anthropologists. do that most archaeologists do that uh talking about we are living in a digital medium this meeting is possible because of the digital medium so it's very important to go ahead with times and uh, for that i try to make short films which are under 2 minutes because the attention span of the millennials is not more than 2 minutes they don't want to see something that is too long because that takes their attention away so you have to cater to the young mind also to the youth right so making short short clips making and uh, you know the culture the heritage give them a, a peek into what it is all about yeah so i feel that's the same talk about academia non academia you know a lot of my friends uh but they get what you know they regret they regret into this good and bold in families we have to be a good mother a good father things like that and then now uh, that part which they left behind why can't they reconnect with what they truly love you know it is not about age you can join things i i did my uh, phd i completed my phd at age 39 yeah so age not in limit uh, why not create uh, uh, an institute which is for academics and non academics the non academics can come taught by professionals who get certificate have a holiday they just take a holiday from their multi the companies their regular jobs and come and pick up bits and pieces of themselves and feel good about life because they just get one life so why and the connecting with that i think that's very important and as um as a human it's very important to understand that there's so many out there who really want that, who really want that so yeah that's my take on the academia and not academia uh ma'am we have got uh, a lot of questions and uh, so uh our first question uh from ruma mukherji uh how do we implement ethno archaeology to uh, read uh, cognitive aspect of past human being and then she has one more question most of the ethno archaeologists have been used direct historical analogy to connect present directly with the past is it possible and then she wants to know something about symbolic archaeology 
Okay, so I'll I'll uh, start taking the questions one by one. Uh, so, how do we implement ethnoarchaeology uh, to reach cognitive aspects of past human beings? Now, the basic premise is that we are all humans. That's one common thing. We are wired in a very similar way. When we look at the pyramids, we look at the Maya architecture, we look at all of this. There is some undercurrent which is very similar because we are humans. We are wired similarly, right? Uh, all of this thing about diffusion, about getting, learning things that this past year, you know, how technology transfers, how technology is um, developed in different parts. It's very, very uh, similar, right? Uh, uh, trade kind of brings them together, their commonalities and things like that. So the one thing is through ethnoarchaeology. And when I say ethnoarchaeology, okay, ethnography is also is very important. It, we normally talk about ethnography being for anthropologists, okay? And uh, uh, all of you who, who are here and uh, you've heard of Olivia Guzalian, who, who used to call himself an ethnoarchaeologist, but a few years ago he published this article uh, uh, called Ethnoarchaeology May Go to Hell. Yeah. And uh, when I read that uh, article, uh, my blood boiled with anger because I felt, how can ethnoarchaeology go to hell? My friends, I, my own professor, has worked a lot on ethnoarchaeology. And I went and I had a dialogue with my professor. And I said, I'm really upset. So she said, Sonali, you need to publish because people like Olivia Gozalian need to know that ethnoarchaeologists also do work, which is because his contention was that anthropologists follow an ethnographic kind of theory, but ethnoarchaeologists don't. They just pick it up and they just do whatever. But it's not like that, right? Ethnoarchaeology is very important because you do get insights. And I wouldn't say that you can read the cognitive aspects of humans in the past, but you get insights to work on. It can never be a one-to-one -one correlation. It just gives you things to, you know, you, you make a hypothesis. And you kind of lay it out and you kind of see the ifs and the buts and the uh, potential, uh, what could be, what, uh, you know, what could not be. So you can, never, you can never arrive at the truth, but it gives you insights to what the truth may be, right? Because get the disturbance again. So I guess I've answered the first part of that. Yeah. Uh, the second is most of ethnoarchaeologists have been used uh, direct historical analysis to connect present reality with the past. No, it is not. It cannot connect present with the past just like that. Analogy. You need to open this. I, I highly stress with all of those who are trying to do um, the present and the past should read analysis widely. It really has. And kind of, you know, it's a work very dense, but kind of you can map it out. But you need relevant analogs to compare the present. So if I'm, I'm okay, so I'll give you an example. I was looking at pottery of the Greco Roman period from the first century CE, from the first historical period to about the fifth century. Okay, now if I uh, look at um, modern day potters who use the electric wheel, that may not be a relevant analog, okay, because there were no electric wheels in the past. So something relevant would be potters who use the same kind of mechanism to make pottery. That would be relevant. So if my insights are based on the present day potters who use the same kind of technology, that would be relevant into understanding. And makes it up. So that thing is and what is the So did you get that? So yeah. that's about that. And part three is uh, something about symbolic archaeology. Yeah, I, I think I really need uh, to ask Ruma what exactly uh, you know uh, symbolism is all over. You know, uh, Om is a symbol and there are marks on temples that are motifs are symbolic. So uh, it's just about uh, layers of meaning. Um, we are, you, you know, even every, every doodle has a symbol as, as a meaning. So I, I need a more specific question. Yes, of course, there's symbolic archaeology, but we need to go deeper. Uh, yeah. We have one question from uh, Hafiz. 
So Hafiz is asking in which extent the anthropological research would be helpful in ending the current ethnic conflicts in some regions and how do you see the role of this field in solving this issue? That how uh, anthropology can be used in ending ethnic conflicts? Yeah. Okay, so um, uh, who, who's asking this question? Uh, let me... Let me happen. Okay. So I think anthropological research is very important. In a class that I teach, I actually teach how uh, anthropology can be used in understanding contemporary social is issues. So for example, something like um, the Ebola virus, right? How did it start? Yeah, in Africa. It was just not that there was this virus and it went over. There was a real problem. The problem was uh, deforestation, cutting of trees, of the forest, which um, kind of people went in because they were in search of food. There was no food available. And the gorillas and uh, the monkeys kind of um, uh, 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 were instrumental in getting this virus uh, uh, go haywire. The problem comes from the grassroots, where there is problem of, uh, you know, uh, food, deforestation, unemployment. All of this is connected. All of this leads to conflict. Conflict with the land. Conflict because of hunger. Conflict with the government. So, of course, anthropological research can help in understanding that these conflicts just don't come out of that. There's a real reason for that. And, uh, in ending current ethnic conflicts, but it can help in understanding that conflicts arise because of this. And that it's really important to make sure in here forming public policies, it's very important to take into consideration what anthropologists have to say, what archaeologists have to say. Because we, archaeologists especially, kind of study some patterns, not short term patterns. What is the effect of long term patterns? You know, what are the effects of short, short term decisions? We have grappled with these things in the past. For example, something like the pandemic. In 1665 in medieval England, we had a problem of the plague. How did people deal with it? There was, uh, you know, all, all of this social distancing and all of this was pre prevalent even there. What lessons have we learned from those episodes? And, you know, just by my uh they say that uh, they are descendants of Alexander the Great, and it's, an, it's a language isolate. It's about three and then you have to up for two hours. Now the quantity of the space has kind of been spoiled because it's known notoriously for uh, Malana cream and drugs and all that, uh, which has become the mainstay of the crop because, you know, what happens? Yeah, you cannot uh, go there or to buy something from the shop. You uh, you can't give money to them directly. You have to keep it down and they pick it up. And it just takes my mind that maybe some Ma'am, your voice is not audible. Like, again, it's like missing at some yeah. point. It's clear here, Avira. I don't know this. No, it's coming. Yeah. This static from somewhere. If you could just check if anybody has their mic uh, unmuted. Sometimes it happens. Yeah, I'm just checking. Yeah. Yeah, they have all unmuted. Only you and me are, like, we are the only people. There must okay. be some kind of issue. Yeah, yeah, just so you can proceed. Okay. So I felt that maybe, you know, those notions of purity and impurity came about because of something like a pandemic where they wanted to protect their people. That can be one possibility. That they were so affected by it that they didn't want anybody to touch them, not to get close to them, you know, things like that. So these are possibilities. Uh, and the way all of us are, you know, anybody wants to come, we get so scared. We don't want them to come. We don't want them to be in close proximity to us. We want them to be at a safe distance. We don't want to touch them. Isn't that true? Right? Yeah. So, so I think uh, anthropological research can help us in understanding uh, um, 
the basis of conflict. It cannot end conflict, but if we have an understanding, it can give us insight into it. Uh, so, ma'am, I wanted to ask you something. Like as you have mentioned, like there are undercurrents and there are common commonalities which uh, are witnessed in different cultural spheres. And even I have seen like there are uh, commonalities between uh, text, like uh, when we see the material culture of Southeast Asia and also of Northeast India. So, have you witnessed something similar, like Himachal culture with some other cultural context? Have you witnessed something similar? I can talk about Southeast Asia and Northeast India. <laughs> yeah, I, I, yeah. <laughs> uh, you want me to talk about that? Yes, ma'am. Please tell me. <laughs> that would be nice. Okay, let me let me first give you an example of uh, this place and Egypt. Okay, so uh, we were excavating in Berenike and uh, we found um, uh, a burial of a cat. Okay, and a dog, and they had this kind of uh, collar which was very uh, sharp. It was very, very sharp. And everybody was like, why do they have this sharp collar? It is so weird. It is so strange. And the minute I saw it, I was like, of course. They want to save it from the wild cat, which would come from the mountains of the Red Sea. They were like, how can you be so sure, Sonali? I said, because in Himachal, the dog, they have these you know, collars, which are very spiny. Because they start that the bark, the tiger, the panther will take uh, those uh, animals away, and they always catch the wild collar. So if they have very um, sharp kind of collars, they won't hit on each other. So there's one kind of similarity that I saw. That is again, yeah. So uh, again, when uh, I was in Southeast Asia, I was working on the Liban textiles of the. Uh, our uh, hunters, uh, uh, former headhunters of Borneo. Now, uh, if they have, they're going to be the hunter who's a hunter. The similarities that I saw were the tattoos, the horned bill, because uh, the totem of the Nagas is uh, the horned bill, and so is the horned bill done. Textiles are kind of similar. Oh, similar. They're also I always try to put culture in that. You know, when you when you look at the Venn diagram, when you uh, when you learned it in school, so the similarity, yeah, differences are a part, but the similarities form in a gray area. Okay, mm -hmm. so the differences are as important as the similarity. And as things is as important as the presence of things. And it's very important as an to remember. Absence something is also a lot. So we have to just not focus on what we see, but what we do not see is also important. Yeah, this is very interesting. Uh, like, uh, which you discussed about your uh, earlier uh, research on Southeast Asia and the similarities. Even like in our collection, we have a huge, uh, like uh, the collection comprises of objects from Northeast India, from <clears throat> very relevant. So we have a lot of things depicting tattoos and then uh, the totem poles belonging to the Hajj Hunter community. So, uh, like, this is very interesting for us. So, ma'am, uh, like, I was also thinking, like, um, in every community, there are some esoteric practices which are happening. And uh, do you feel it is a bit difficult for you to enter into their space and know about the, like, about the religious practices which they practice in secrecy? And then it is also difficult for you to document them. Uh, so, uh, giving an example of the Kulu Valley itself, you know, uh, when I started working here in the first year, I was like quite an outsider. I really had to make my space. And then coming back again, they kind of get more friendlier and they understood, okay, I'm here. And now when I came, they said, oh, she's here to stay. So the familiarity and the comfort level became more and more. And I always say that even to my students, that it's very important that you do not objectify people. You're not there because they are a part of your research and you have something to extract from there and that's the story. You have to make them a part 
of your story not a part so you know so there's a difference a part and a part okay so you have to really uh, walk that line navigate not like really from the heart of heart become one with them without losing the perspective of an anthropologist and be attentive to what your education has asked you but also get the mind now in the beginning they would tell me about this practice i was with them now i know about so many things that i was oblivious of uh, ritual killing okay uh, sometimes they tell me that you not for this uh, and it is respect them because it's just not about my research it's also about respect them they come okay so uh, this is uh some of them i can share like uh, this recent book you know that the the turbulence again yeah 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 it never happened at my end i i i don't know where is this coming from uh but anyway so um when they select a gore a shaman what happens is uh even that if that shaman is um, so the caste has nothing to do with it this is a very caste oriented society ha huh? but when the god or the god or the goddess select their spokes person um they do not see the caste it can be anybody okay and uh, but the norms of the people are followed so if god or the goddess has two shamans and one of them is a low caste and the other is a high caste the low caste and so okay what the impact is on them i was just to see that i never knew that till i observed and that was very important to an anthropologist who really experiences it and sees it and i was what is terrible they follow the caste system it's a that uh, even if the um uh, uh the shaman is a vegetarian okay he's not eat well when he has to prove that he is the chosen one he has to give blood out of his head to protect those okay hmm. so there are some some practices that i i did not know of that they have to give raw meat and raw blood so these are very very uh, they are secret practices and yeah. i won't ever be able to film it but uh, i can talk about it i have the permission to talk about it uh, so ma'am as you were talking about the like uh, the Uh, the the impact of casteism in the ritualistic practices i have seen the same while uh, i was like as a part of the museum collection we have a lot of musical instruments so we have musical instruments from uh, from himachal pradesh as well so like the player is from a different caste he is he belongs to an upper caste and the maker he belongs to a local lower caste so there is a very strict distinction between the strata of the society and uh, i like what i have uh, observed like it also uh, it also plays a important role in your ethno archaeological studies as well so uh, like i would uh, i would request dr swati to uh, please uh, pose some questions like we, which you like which might be you might be thinking of Um, actually, I was thinking that it's a very, um, very knowledgeable and very informative session. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Sonali, for this uh, wonderful insight. But it would be wonderful if you, if we would have some visual impact because if you kindly share, if you have with you right now some of the pictures, so we can have the visual impact very clearly. So actually, I am very much interested to, you know, visualize. I I do not have any many visuals. Let me see. But before uh, I show them to you, I do want to, um, uh, you know, when uh, Abira was just talking about, you know, uh, the strata that how it is uh, totally differentiated, and there was this question which I earlier saw in phenomenological uh, archaeology, right? Experience. Yeah. Yeah. And phenomenological archaeology. Yeah. yeah. And I think it's a very important part of what I do. Yeah. Okay. So when you go to a place, when you go to a site, 
where the ritual is performed. Uh, I'll give you an example, okay? When we walk into a classroom, the teacher's place is already decided. The teacher knows where to stand. The student knows where to sit. The student will never stand at the place of the teacher. Tasks here are already it's demarcated where the lower class Understand where the higher class is going to be, where the sanctum sanctorum is going to be entered. It's already decided for you. Uh, the space uh, tells you a lot about what's going on. Not about gender spacing. So, given looking at what's going uh, the space and uh, uh, in action, the action when you right. Um, with ancient sacred spaces, how they're used today, is also very revealing. Because when when I excavate, I'll be able to compare the change, the continuity. You know. I hope I'm able to answer. Yes. Uh, you know. Yes. Absolutely. Absolutely right. Absolutely. You have yeah. rightly pointed out about that one. So uh, we are almost at the end of our uh, discussion for today's webinar, and yeah. uh, it's it's wonderful, uh, you know, interactive session. More, uh, you know, lots of questions have been asked by the participants. So <coughs> most interactive session, I would rather say. And thank you so much, first of all, uh, our respected uh, speaker for today's webinar, Dr. Sonali Gupta, with her wonderful journey from being a lawyer and how the transformation has been taken place. It's more of a like a, a career changing. It's not about the career changing. It's about the previous career and how you are going to enter into the new journey with your previous journey. So it's a wonderful uh, assimilation of our heritage. Our uh, uh, it's kind of a what would I like to say that when we actually go into our in-laws house. We actually carry forward our uh, parental uh, culture, parental attire with us to the in-laws' house. Then we actually incorporate the new journey with a good vibe. So that's a wonderful uh, illustration from your end. And now I'm coming to Abira, a wonderful moderator with the uh, you. Uh, you know interactive question answer session and i really really overwhelmed with the participants uh, over here for today's presentation particularly and thank you dr sonali and you have shared the link to uh, wonderful people around the world so they have joined and they have been connected with with platform for dialogue so i uh, end up the session with a very positive note from dr sonali gupta uh, please don't be uh, think about the network issues, the uh, uh, the other te uh, you know technical glitches. It could be part of our journey. But uh, the most important thing is we are together here finally to hear you. And from your uh, you know voice of note, from your positivity, we came to know so many facts of the Himalayan region. And uh, I would really really be expected you for another round of discussions. Um, on a on a visual on a video note that how you are doing your uh, research in Himalayan Institute, it would be wonderful if you kindly present that presentation in front of us, like Abira did uh, last time, the uh, Indian Museum virtual journey, and it was really interesting. So we enjoyed that in the pandemic we actually uh, fruitful session that we can able to see. Even we can't able to visit physically, but uh, with the lens of from Abira, we can actually able to see that what's happening there. So, uh, Dr. Sonali, I request uh, to you also if you can just uh, uh, give us a visual impact of the Himalayan Institute from your end. So maybe in the uh, next uh, webinar series, we can uh, have that one. Definitely, and I would urge all of uh, the audience. Uh, you know, we have uh, the Himalayan Institute page. It's called the Himalayan Institute of Cultural and Heritage Studies on Facebook and on Instagram. Do follow us and our YouTube channel, which has 
So all of you are invited. We have an open kind of uh, uh, talk. Um, it's called the Unlock Series. It was what to do. The Corona has prompted all of us to come together in these little windows. So every Sunday, and we've kind of changed the timing to 8 p.m. The stage is abroad also to join in. So all of you are welcome. Every Sunday at 8 p.m., we have talks by uh, wonderful scholars from all over the Himalayas and also who are not from the Himalayas who can give us insight into the kind of work. And uh, we already have a lot of recorded uh, sessions on our channels to do what? Very, very enlightening to all of those who are interested. And uh, uh, Dr. Swati, I want to thank you uh, for inviting me on your platform and, uh, you know, making me meet Abira virtually here. And of course, uh, it's highly commendable. You know, you have a two-year-old uh, boy and uh, you're doing all of this. Uh, it's really, uh, you know, whenever uh, people say, oh, you know, women, uh, they get kind of... Um, and work. You know, I see women here like you, Dr. Angelic, Anjali Kapila, and all of you are here. You know, uh, it's a journey. Uh, you know, we set our own limits and we can do anything we want to if we set our time. And that should be the message for anyone at any Dr. Sadali, please uh, excuse me. I, I really request you to share the Facebook link, the all of the links you have related with your institute, kindly post in the chat box. So the participants over here, they can uh, directly connect with you. Can you do it now? Yes, in the chat box. Okay, let me do it. Uh, uh, okay. I'm Can everybody find? I'm not very keen on multitasking, but uh, I'll just open the page. Okay, I've got the link and I'm going to post it yes. right now. That's wonderful because who have been interested, they can directly connect with you. So, That's the platform case. for dialogue is actually creating the space for the uh, like-minded people who really would like to join uh, irrespective of any field because uh, what I believe that archaeology, anthropology, any field you can join any point of time. You, you know, it doesn't matter about your age, about your gender, nothing. I think so. Because I have started my journey as a geographer and then I shifted to human rights and now I'm a dialogue practitioner so it's more of a uh, variety I am having and with my I think age maturity maybe I'll opt for another master's in archaeology and anthropology because I'm really really into interested because my PhD guy he is an anthropologist so I don't know maybe <laughs> in upcoming days so thank you thank you and um, for this wonderful insight thank you and thank you Abira again thank you so and, much thank you. Yeah, and thank you all for being in attendance today. It's been lovely, <laughs> uh, uh, you know, having you all here and uh, uh, tolerating all the ups and downs of electricity and the net.